Good evening, everyone. I'm James Wetzel, the producer of adult programs at the Museum of Science. And I am so excited to welcome you to our program, A Drink Under the Stars with Paul Sutter. Tonight is a part of our virtual season of adult programming, uh, which is a part of our MOS at Home initiative. We have turned the Museum of Science into a virtual museum during this time of isolation and are offering free daily programming on our digital platforms. And as a part of that, I'm so happy to say we have launched our subspace adult programs after dark channel to support tonight's event and the rest of our really fantastic lineup. And I'm thrilled to be kicking the season off tonight with our friend, Dr. Paul M. Sutter, who is an amazing astrophysicist that we have had several collaborations with over the past couple of years. And we're such a fan of his brand and the way that he explores astrophysics and space in really accessible ways. And I'm thrilled that we can bring him into all of your homes this evening for this fantastic talk. And we are so thrilled uh, again to launch this programming and we have a lot of fantastic events still to come over the next couple of months. Um, so please check out our website at mos.org slash mos at home uh, to take a look at the full lineup and join us after dark. Now tonight is fully interactive. If you have questions for Paul, we encourage you to share those questions through the Q&A at the bottom of your screen if you're watching on Zoom with us and um, Paul will get through as many of those questions as he possibly can this evening. And I also just wanna say before we bring Paul out, a very special thanks to our friends at the Lowell Institute for their continued support of our adult programming. It is because of them that we are here tonight and we are able to offer this fantastic event for all of you for free during these unusual times and circumstances. So please join me in a big virtual round of applause of thanks for the Lowell Institute. Now I hope that you have your cocktail and one of, or one of our mocktails ready. It is time to sit back, relax, and enjoy a journey through our universe. So please join me in welcoming to the Zoom with a drink under the stars, our friend, Dr. Paul M. Sutter. Take it away, Paul. Hey everyone, thank you so much again for joining me and thank you, huge shout out to James and all the team at the Boston Museum of Science for putting this on. Like James said, I hope you have your drink in hand. Uh, I have the suggested mocktail for tonight because someone has to be the designated driver through the universe. So I'm sipping on some lemonade and ginger beer. Hmm with a little bit of honey and muddled rosemary in there, giving a nice earthy hint. Uh, like James mentioned, uh, this is super interactive. Uh, I'm gonna pull up some astronomy software on my computer. I'm gonna do some screen shares. We're gonna float around the night sky, go around the universe. We got a whole hour to chill out, all right? So I want you to enjoy yourself. I want you to get curious. You are in control. I mean, not really, I'm in control because I'm driving it, but you get to suggest what I might do and it's up to me whether I go with that or not. So that's kind of like being in control, right? Go to the Q&A section on your Zoom platform and start hitting me up with some questions. Like James said, we got a whole hour. I'm gonna to try to get through as many questions as possible and, and spacey questions. If you need relationship advice, that is a different webinar. That is not for tonight, okay? It's just about space and physics and astronomy. And uh, let me go ahead and get started by sharing my screen here. So everybody should see some planetarium software showing the night sky. This is free software. You can actually download it on your very own computer for your own amusement, delight, and education. It's called Stellarium. It's absolutely free. And the view we're starting off with tonight is from Boston. Obviously, this doesn't look like Boston, but, you know, maybe some farmy suburb of Boston, but this is real time. This is real time. So I don't know if you can see the outside world from your underground bunker, but if you do happen to have a window, uh, you will see the sun setting over the west, northwest horizon. And that's exactly what we are looking at right now. And if you were to look outside, I bet, I bet you haven't even noticed this or you notice this without 
knowing that you noticed it. Check this out. When you go look at sunset right around now, this is a great time to see it. Eight o'clock, there's going to be an incredibly bright star right here hanging out in the west, northwest sky. But this is astronomy software. The real sky is not labeled with words, just in case you were wondering. It's in the astronomy software. It's telling you that this is Venus. This is actually the planet Venus. You can pick out planets, by the way, if you've ever wondered if you'd seen something bright in the sky and you're wondering, is that a planet or is it a star? Is it a meteor? Is it a UFO? What is it? Stars twinkle, but planets don't. So if you stare at something in the night sky for a really long time and it's not wibbling or wobbling or twinkling, it is a planet. And Venus is one of the brightest objects in the entire sky. In fact, it's the third brightest object in the sky. Does anyone know? Does anyone know? We're, I'm going to take a sip of my drink. Does anyone know, pop quiz, what the brightest object in the sky is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's the sun, okay? The sun. I'm not, I'm not even going to pretend to know what percentage of you got that right. The sun is the brightest thing. The moon is the second. Third is Venus. But check this out. You can see it in the, in the, in the dawn, or sorry, in the evening sky. Check this out. If you have binoculars, even just small binoculars, slap on some binoculars and you'll get a zoomed in view of Venus and you will get perhaps the most surprising surprise of your life. I don't know. Maybe it's going to be top five or top 10 for you, but you zoom in, check out what happens to Venus. I'm going to zoom in here in the software. This is real time. Look at that. You won't see a solid white ball. No, you're going to see a crescent. You're going to see a crescent. Why? Because the sun is down here. The sun is setting down where my cursor is. So it's only illuminating a portion of Venus from our point of view here on Earth. Venus goes through phases the exact same way that the moon goes through phases. There are crescent Venuses and half Venuses and whole Venuses. There's the whole, the whole deal all right there. The first person to figure this out, to see this, was Galileo himself, because you can't see this with the naked eye. You just see like a bright thing in the sky. But with a telescope, even a very weak one, even with binoculars that you probably have at home, you can pick out the crescent of Venus. And you can see that it goes through changes. This was one of the big reasons that Galileo's like, hey, I think maybe the Earth is not at the center of the, of the universe. Maybe the sun is. I don't know. I'm just putting that out there. Re example, exhibit A, Venus goes through phases, but you can see it tonight. You can see it right now. Like you could get off this webinar if you want to. I encourage you to stay for the whole thing. Then do this tomorrow night. But you could literally go outside right now with some binoculars and see Venus. We're already getting questions. Nancy <laughs> Graziano um, is asking, what cheese would I pair with this mocktail? For those of you don't, who don't know, I do a live show every Thursday called Space Radio. It streams to YouTube and to Twitch. At the end of every episode, I, I try a new kind of cheese. It's kind of a thing. It's kind of a thing. With this, with this a ginger beer, since there's a lot of spice in ginger beer, I'd probably want to go with the mellow end of cheese and go with something like a nice Gouda or a Don, something, something Dutch. Um, Dana Sasso is asking, I'll, I'll go ahead and do a couple questions and we'll go on to our tour of uh, the night sky because I do want to show you guys some things that you can see in the night sky tonight and in the weeks to come. But Dana Sasso is asking, how big is the average black hole? Uh, there are two kinds of black holes. There are relatively small ones that are a few times the mass of the sun. These are very, very small. These are smaller than Boston. These are about the size of a city neighborhood. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there are truly massive ones, the ones we call super massive black holes that are millions or billions of times larger than the sun. And these can get monstrous. Uh, the one in the center of the Milky Way galaxy is bigger than our sun. Uh, if you remember that picture of a black hole that came out last year, that was bigger than our entire solar system. 
So there's two main sizes of black holes. One size is way tiny and the other size is way biggie. Moving on, there's something else I want to point out in the night sky, in the dawn sky. Right over here, if you look, once you spot Venus, once you spot Venus, and again, this is real time in this astronomy software in Stellarium, so it's a quarter after eight. Right now, if you were to look in the southwest west direction, you're going to see a very, very prominent constellation, a very famous constellation. I'll go ahead and put up some constellation lines here and some names. And so that is Orion, the hunter. You can identify Orion. There's going to be three stars right in a row. Boop, boop, boop. That is the belt of Orion. It's got two bright shoulders. One of them is Betelgeuse, uh, also pronounced Betelgeuse. There's a few different pronunciations of it, but whatever you do, don't say it three times. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Betelgeuse is, uh, that was in the news this year. It was dimming and getting brighter. People were wondering what the heck was going on. Was it going to go supernova? Yes, this is a giant star near the end of its life. It is about to go supernova any day now. Any day now, astronomically speaking, which means like within the next million years. But that's basically any day now, right? When it comes to astronomy, that star is going to go supernova. And when this thing blows, it's going to be awesome. I wish, I wish it would go supernova in our lifetimes because I would love to see it. It's, it'll be so bright. It'll be so bright. It'll be so bright. It will be as bright as the moon. I'm not joking. When this star dies, it will be as bright as the moon. It will be visible during the day as a bright point of light in the middle of the day. At night, it will be bright enough to cast shadows. You will be able to read a book from the light of this star. It is just amazing to think about. It will only last two or three weeks before it fades down. But for those two or three weeks, it will be brighter than the full moon. That's, it's just crazy to think about. It's not going to harm us. Don't worry. It's, it's hundreds of light years away. When it blows up, it's not going to kill us all. We're good. We checked. We did the math. But you can check out that star. Betelgeuse is nice and red. It is a big, fat red star. So once you find Venus over here from the setting sun right there, you're just going to go straight left, and you'll pop onto the shoulder of Orion, and you'll be able to see Orion above the horizon. Um, there's more questions. Uh, Lauren is asking, can I zoom in on Mars? I will do that in a little bit. I will do that on Mars. Uh, I'll give us some more views of Mars in just a little bit. Don't worry. All right. Maggie is asking, what's my favorite constellation? Orion is certainly up there. The Hunter is one of my favorite constellations just because it's so big. It's so striking, so beautiful. Uh, my favorite constellation, though, is Scorpius, the Scorpion. Uh, it's not really vi well visible from the northern hemisphere. You tend to have to go down to uh, the equator or further south to see it, see it really well, but it's it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous constellation. It has a very bright red star in the center that just looks really intense. It's just always been captivating for me for, for no reason in particular, except, you know, it's gorgeous. I'm going to go ahead and take our astronomy software and skip forward into the future. So everyone, strap your seatbelts. Take a sip of your drink because we're going to time travel. Are you ready? I don't care if you're ready. We're doing it. We're doing it. Here we go. We are advancing into the future. It is now 8.30 p.m. Oh, look at this. And as we go into the future, the sun is setting. More stars are coming out. We are nearing 9 o'clock. I'm going to take us to 10 o'clock tonight. So I don't know where you are in your life. I don't know how busy your days are. I don't know how tired you get at night having to like homeschool your kids and everything. Uh, but if, if you have the capacity to stay up for a couple hours, and it looks like right here where I am, it's a pretty clear night tonight. So hopefully it's a clear night for you too. We're going to take this down to around 10 o'clock tonight uh, to see what kind of constellations and stars we can see and also some deep sky objects. And I know I'm talking into my drink. 
I know what I'm doing. All right, let's take it close enough. Here we are around 10 o'clock tonight. And now, now the sun is completely down. This software is so cool. It simulates light pollution on the sky. And <clears throat> uh, as you can see, Orion is barely above there. He's sinking down into the ground. But there is are a few constellations I want to show you. So you can walk around the night sky and kind of guide yourself. And we're going to start by looking north. We're going to start like looking directly north. There is a star right there called Polaris. Polaris is, as you might imagine, it is the North Star. And <clears throat> to show you why it's called Polaris, what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip around in time a little bit. And I want you to watch all the other stars in relation to Polaris. See what the other stars do and then watch what Polaris does. So we're, I'm going to skip forward into the future really fast. Don't worry, I'll come back. I'll come back. So here we go. Look what happens. Look over the course of the night, all these stars wheeling around the sky as the Earth spins, but Polaris stays fixed. And I can even bring us back, back to 10 o'clock p.m. tonight. And it's just going in the opposite direction. I am moving, physically moving the Earth backwards, in case you were wondering. And this is why it's called Polaris, because it's at the pole of the earth, the North Pole. If you were to take a, a rod and it was sticking out of the North Pole of the earth and punching into the sky, it would hit the sky right there at Polaris. That is our North Star. And zooming in just a little bit, we can see Polaris is part of a constellation called Ursa Minor, AKA the Little Bear. If you need help uh, seeing how this looks like a bear because it kind of looks more like a spoon with a ladle, I can bring up some art. And look, see, it's a cute little bear with a weirdly long tail. But okay, bears are different, okay? Bears are different back then when we were naming constellations. Uh, it's part of the little bear constellation. And if you go, if you find a Polaris, then keep looking up, you're gonna come to another constellation this big one right in the center. This is called Ursa Major. I'll show you the picture of it. Look, it's a big bear. See, little bear, little baby bear, and then big mama bear right there. And there's a part of the Ursa Major constellation. Like this constellation is huge. It takes up a big chunk of the sky, but there's a part of it right here that we call the Big Dipper. Right here, this is the back end of the bear was that like the chuck roast or whatever part of the animal that is in the tail. I don't eat bears, so I don't really know, but you can spot the Big Dipper right here. So to, again, to spot the Big Dipper, you're gonna find Polaris, and then you're just gonna keep craning your neck upwards and you'll spot it here. Then I wanna show you a little like astronomy trick for zooming around the sky and impressing your friends. You see the arch here of the Dipper right here. So you got the ladle, the big cup, and then this handle, this nice curving handle. If you follow the arch in the sky, you go bing, 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 keep following, keep following, keep following, keep following, boom. You'll land on a big bright red star called Arcturus. And this constellate, and this star is part of a constellation called Booties or Bodes, depending on how sassy you're feeling when you want to pronounce it. And the trick here to remember it is you follow the arc of the Big Dipper, you arc, boom, to Arcturus right there. So if you really want to show people, you're like, check it out, there's the Big Dipper, and then I'm going to arc to Arcturus, Arcturus, but it doesn't stop there. Why would astronomy jokes stop right there? No, 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 We're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. We arced to Arctur Arcturus. I'm going to zoom out so you can see this whole joke play out. This is how astronomers amuse themselves, by the way. Here's the Big Dipper. Here's the Big Dipper. You arc to Arcturus, then you're going to speed in a straight line to Spica. Spica is a very bright white star. And Spica is a part of a massive constellation called Virgo the Virgin. So you're gonna arc to Arcturus, 
then speed to Spica. And right there, you've picked up three constellations. You've picked up Ursa Major, you've picked up Boades, and you've picked up Virgo. Now, now you're thinking, Paul, no, that's, that's way too many astronomy puns. Surely, surely that's the end of it. Because that's, that's two jokes that we can't handle anymore. No, no. Astronomers take it one step further. Why? Because they have to stay up all night and they get really bored, okay? We arc to Arcturus. We speed to Spica. And then one of my other favorite constellations is right here. It's really, really, really small. It's this little constellation called here, called Corvus. It's Corvus the crow. I'll show you a little picture. There it is. There's a little crow, Corvus. There's Virgo. There's Bodies. Um, arc to Arcturus. Speed to Spica. Crawl to Corvus. Huh? Huh? Don't tune out yet. I swear this gets better. Okay. Um, I swear, I swear that's the end of the, the bad astronomy jokes. You arc to Arcturus, you speed to Spica, you crawl to Corvus. There is a star. The reason I want to show you Corvus, there is a star here. You see this star? I'm going to zoom in a little bit. It's a very, very simple constellation. It looks like a kite. It's relatively dim, so you need a kind of a clear night to see it. You see this star here, right there? Kraz, K-R-A-Z. Uh, there's nothing special about the star. It's just, it's just a star. Kraz, though, this word, Kraz. We have no idea what this word means. We have no idea what language this word comes from. Whoever named this star, Kraz, named it thousands of years ago, somewhere in Mesopotamia, somewhere in the Fertile Crescent, somewhere in the Middle East, but was part of a language or proto-language that doesn't exist anymore and isn't traced in any like modern day languages. We don't know why this star is called Kras. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know what the word means. We don't know what it references. Maybe it was just like somebody and they're like finally like naming all the stars and they're like, what should we call this one? I'm like, I don't know. I think I'm going to name it after you, my best friend. You're Kras. I'm going to call Kras because you're my bro. Maybe we don't know. We don't know what constellation that ancient culture saw in this patch of the sky to call it Kras. Uh, we even have records from 2000 or from a thousand years ago and even 2000 years ago saying, yeah, we call it Kras. We don't know why everyone calls it Kras, but like it does and, and we don't have the records. So the, just think about this. When you're looking at this constellation Corvus, People have been looking at this constellation for thousands of years, have been naming it for thousands of years. And some of those names like Kras, the meaning of that name has been lost to history, but the name itself has been preserved through astronomy. And that's right there, over there in your Southern sky in the constellation Corvus, the crow. There's one more constellation I wanna show you. It looks, it goes straight up and then I'll do some more questions. It's over here. There's Ursa Major and then there's Lynx and it's right there on the opposite side of Ursa Major. So I'm, I know I'm wheeling around here. So you can either find it two ways. It's in your Southwest sky looking up or once you find Polaris, then you look up to Ursa Major and then you keep going up, 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 up. And eventually you'll come on Leo the Lion, which is this giant constellation almost directly above you. It looks absolutely gorgeous. It's a very nice looking constellation. You'll be able to see this like question, backwards question mark thing in the sky. That's, you're gonna get a delight. You're gonna like it. Let me uh, answer some of the questions from from the folks. We've got a question, uh, anonymous attendee, great name. Is there anything in science like warp speed? Do we need warp to visit the star? So staple of science fiction, right? We're gonna go at light speed. We're gonna, we're gonna travel faster than the speed of light. We're gonna get to the next star, why? Because if we were gonna go actually limited by the speed of light, 
it would take us, you know, tens of thousands of years to reach another star. And nobody has time for that, even in lockdown, even watching every single show on Netflix that exists. One episode that lasts 18,000 years, that might be a bit much. So for the sake of convenience, for the sake of plot, we're going we're gonna to go faster than the speed of light so we can get to that other star so we can get, move along with this story. That's not a thing. As far as we can tell, fat, travel faster than the speed of light is forbidden in our universe. We've tested it. We've checked. Of course, we might be wrong, but we've been testing it for about 100 years now. We're really confident about it. We feel, we feel good about it. Um, it's, it's just not going to be a thing. Travel to the stars is cumbersome. It is slow. It is painful. It is expensive and there's just no way around it. So we're just gonna enjoy it from Earth, all right? We got telescopes, we're good. We don't need to visit Kras, all right? We can just look at it through a telescope. Um, another question, can you tell us about the James Webb Telescope planned for launch next year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The James Webb Space Telescope is going to be obviously a space telescope. It is a, a massive, massive telescope. In fact, it's so big. How big is it? It's so big, it actually can't fit in a rocket. All right. It's wider than the rocket that is going to be used to take it into space. So what they have is this giant mirror that's broken up into segments uh, like hexagons all packed together and then they're all folded up together like an origami flower and then put into the rocket. Then the rocket blasts off, James Webb goes into space and then hopefully, if everything goes right, unfolds and you have this giant uh, 36 meter diameter telescope in space. The James Webb Space Telescope will be focused on hunting for planets around other stars. It will be focused on looking at stellar nurseries, peeking inside of gas clouds to see little baby stars being born. It'll be so cute. And they're also focused on hunting for the first stars and galaxies to appear in the universe. James Webb Space Telescope has been delayed by like, I don't know, a decade by now. It is over budget by like a gajillion dollars cross your fingers, it actually launches next year. It'll take about a year to get to its uh, place, observing place in the solar system, where it's gonna make, take all its data and take first light. So we're at least a couple years out. Um, yes, uh, I will answer some more questions. Thank you for keep, keep putting them up. I wanna show you guys, these were like the stuff you can see with the naked eye. You can see Venus, you can see these cool constellations, you can bounce around the sky but there's more to the night sky. There are, and I'll bring them up here, the deep sky objects. These are the things that are really, really far away. And there's stuff that you can see with a small telescope with decent binoculars if it's dark enough. So if you're in the middle of Boston, if you're in the middle of a city, you're probably already lost because you can't even see 90% of what's in this software. But if you do have a reasonably dark sky, if you have a chance to get out into the countryside, you, the night sky is going to light up like a Christmas tree. It's going to be gorgeous. Um, I do want to show you some galaxies, some very, very pretty galaxies like the Pinwheel Galaxy, which is over here near the arc of the Big Dipper. It's just below the arm here, so we're gonna zoom in. Now this guy's a little bit far away. Pinwheel Galaxy is uh, 20 million light years away, but look at that. This is an entire galaxy, home to hundreds of billions of stars. This is big, this is a big galaxy. This is about the size of the Milky Way galaxy, roughly gorgeous looking spiral pattern design. They got the bright core. You've got these dark dust lanes. You've got these bright star forming regions. It's just a gorgeous, gorgeous galaxy. Um, with binoculars, with even a strong telescope, you're just gonna see a slightly fuzzy patch. I mean, this thing is 20 million light years away. What am I gonna do, okay? This is, this is reality. But I wanted to show you this, like just hiding, just hiding right underneath this arc 
of the Big Dipper. Boom, boom, boom. When you see those last two stars, there's this galaxy 20 million light years away right there. But um, there's another galaxy I want to show you, and then I'll show you some things closer to home. I'm going to show you the Sombrero Galaxy, because why not? Because it's an awesome name, and you'll see why it's called the Sombrero Galaxy here in a little bit when I zoom in. It's the same deal. It's, it's a spiral galaxy, uh, but this time, instead of seeing it face on, like we saw the pinwheel, so we got to see all those pretty arms, we're seeing this one edge on. So we see this really gorgeous dark dust lane cutting right through the center of the image with a, a bright core backlighting it. I mean, it's just stunning. This is just a stunning, stunning galaxy. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image of the Sombrero Galaxy. And it's, it's just pretty. This is one of my favorite things about astronomy is that hiding there, right in the spaces between the stars are some of the most gorgeous things you could ever possibly comprehend. So that's the Sombrero Galaxy. But let me show you something a little bit closer to home. And I'm gonna search here. I'm gonna bring up something called the Owl Nebula. right over here and again this is in ursa major a lot of these things i'm showing you here's the arc this is the big dipper so right in the bowl of the big dipper there's a little nebula here very close only 2000 light years away only 2000 light years away right here in the big Dipper. we're going to zoom in and we're going to see something called the owl nebula now can you see why it's called the owl nebula um, no, not me neither. Me neither. Apparently, like, oh my gosh, so many nebula were named in the 1800s when we finally started to have big enough telescopes to actually see details inside of these nebula. And in that, on the old timey telescopes, we didn't even have photographs. We, we were just, people were just staring through these telescopes and drawing sketches. And then you end up with so many weird names because they kind of sort of look like something vaguely familiar. And, you know, the astronomer who discovered it was up all night, you know, is not in the best headspace and saying like, yeah, that totally looks like an owl. Yep. So maybe at the end of this show, after you finish your drink, it might look like an owl. I don't know. It looks like a blob to me. Um, this is the Owl Nebula. The Owl Nebula is a kind of nebula called a planetary nebula. Don't even get me started on that name. Has nothing to do with planets. But again, 1800s astronomers, pretty confused bunch, name stuck. This is what happens. This nebula, something like this, is what our own sun is going to end up doing in 5 billion years. Our own sun is going to die. Eventually, it's going to run out of hydrogen to fuse. It's going to run out of power. It's going to go through a few fits and starts. It's going to become a red giant. It's going to swallow the earth, blah, blah, blah. We don't need to worry about it right now. At the end stage, though, it's going to eject about half of its atmosphere out into the solar system. Just It's going to turn itself inside out and spew its guts out all over the place. And then what will be left after the sun has exploded half of itself will be the core, a white hot carbon and oxygen core, something called a white dwarf, that's going to be blazing hot. It's going to have a temperature of like 10 million Kelvin, and it's going to be spewing out x-rays. It's going to be hilarious um, for any remaining life in the solar system, but it will light up all that gas that it spewed out, and it will give us something like this. Each planetary nebula is totally unique in the universe. No two are alike. This one looks like this, which apparently looks kind of sort of like an owl, I guess. What will our sun look like? We have no idea. We have no idea because it's, it's all based on very complicated physics that are, you know, you can't predict what kind of nebula our sun will turn into. It'll be very pretty for about 10,000 years. And then the core, that white dwarf core will cool off and it won't be able to illuminate the planetary nebula. Uh, you can see something like the Owl Nebula with a decently powered telescope in, in some dark skies. You'll see a little roundy fuzzy patch, which is about what you should expect 
for a nebula. But there's something else you can see. There's something else you can see that looks absolutely nothing like a nebula. And that's the beehive cluster over here. And again, this is tonight's sky. This is tonight's sky. So you could go out at 10, around 10 o'clock tonight and, and actually see this stuff. So here we are at the beehive cluster and I'm gonna zoom in and right away, this thing is close. This thing is uh, just over 500 light years away. And if you point, even with telescope, uh, binoculars, even with binoculars, you point at this patch of the sky, you're going to get dazzled, like bedazzled. You're going to do Pshh! like all these stars are just going to fill up your field of view. You know, it'll look something like this. You'll be like, wow, that's a lot of stars. These kinds of clusters look absolutely gorgeous in binoculars or telescopes. Because as you're scanning around, the, scanning around the sky, if you're just looking with binoculars and you're looking around, you'll see a bunch of stars and you know, a bunch of blank spaces. And then you'll come across a cluster like this. Like, like seriously, like look, you'll be scanning around. You're like, dee dee doo dee doo Look at all those stars. And then you're like, wow, look at that. This is something called an open cluster. All these stars are siblings. All these stars are brothers and sisters. All these stars were born from the same cloud of gas and dust, the same star forming region. They were all born relatively around the same time. They have relatively the same age. And the nebula that they were born from has been blown away by all the star formation activity. And now they're getting, getting to hang out. They are slowly spreading apart getting further and further away as siblings tend to do. Uh, but for now, they still maintain a cluster shape, which is how they stand out. But all these, this is a batch. This is a brand new batch of baby stars that you get to see with reasonably, reasonably decent uh, binoculars. Uh, before I finish up, that's it. What's it tonight? This is tonight's sky, and, and like basically for the next couple of weeks, this is the sky you'll see. There are some events I want to point out uh, coming up uh, for the rest of April and into May, but there are some questions about the universe that I want to get to. Uh, anonymous attendee is wondering, um, thank you for hosting this event. Thank you for watching. Uh, the question is this, prior to the Big Bang, where did all the original like stuff come from before the Big Bang? Some of you may be familiar with the Big Bang Theory. I will say this as emphatically as possible. I'm looking right at the camera, so you got me? Okay, take, it, take a sip of your drink if you need it. Mm -hmm. That's all right, we're all in this together. I want, do I have your eyes? All right, you paying attention here? The Big Bang Theory is not a theory of the origins of the universe. Okay, okay, I'm gonna say it again. I'm gonna say it again in case you didn't catch it the first time. The Big Bang Theory is not a theory of the origins of our universe. We don't know how the universe started. We don't know what came before the universe. We don't even know if that question makes sense. We don't know. What the Big Bang Theory is, is a theory or a story a model of what the universe was like in its earliest moments. In its earliest moments, the universe was much smaller, was much hotter, was much denser than it is today. That's it. And then the universe expands. That's it. That's it. There's a lot more to it, but that's the basic idea. The basic idea is that 13.8 billion years ago, our entire universe was about the size of a peach and at a temperature of about a quadrillion degrees. That's it. What came before? Was there before? Does that question even make sense? We don't know. And anyone who says they know is lying to you, okay? Okay, you heard it from me. <sighs> Good question, though. Joey is asking, why are astronomers perplexed that the expansion of the universe is accelerating? Good question. So the universe is getting bigger every day. All right. We've known this for a hundred years. Galaxies like the pinwheel galaxy, like the sombrero galaxy, they are getting farther away from us with time. 
The Sombrero Galaxy was closer to us yesterday than it is today, and it's closer to us today than it will be tomorrow. It is getting further away from us. Every galaxy in our universe is getting further away from every other galaxy in the universe. We live in an expanding universe. The universe changes with time. What we found out to our consternation 20 years ago, 23 years ago, was that not only is the universe expanding, but that expansion is accelerating. So not only is the universe getting bigger and bigger every day, it's getting bigger and bigger, faster and faster every day. And this is weird. Something isn't, the universe isn't just expanding and la ti da and getting bigger. Something is ripping it apart. Something is pushing it apart. There is a large scale universal anti-gravity at work to not just pull things in, but to make things want to get even faster, further away. We call this dark energy. We've got no clue what's going on. Yeah, it's been a couple decades since we discovered it. We know it's there. We know it's there. The evidence is incontrovertible at this point. Multiple lines of evidence pointing to an ex accelerating expansion of the universe. <sighs> We don't know what it is. We don't know what's causing it. We don't know why it has the strength it does. We don't know if it was weaker in the past or stronger in the past or it's been the same. We don't know. We call it dark energy because that name rocks. It sounds mysterious and helps give grants. But other than that, we don't know. Uh, Jamie is asking, do the moon and Venus have the same phase at the same time? So I mentioned how Venus is at quarter phase or at uh, crescent Venus right now, if you were to look out in the sky. Actually, by now, it's probably a little bit too late. I think Venus is probably dipped below the horizon. Uh, and the moon goes through phases. They are going to be different. It all depends on where Earth is, where the moon is, and where Venus is relative to the sun. So the moon is going to orbit the earth once a month, roughly. And over the course of that month, it will change through its different phases because you're getting different views of the moon at different times. Meanwhile, Venus is way over here doing its thing, doing its orbit around the sun, which is a little less than a year. And as it goes through its orbit and the Earth goes through its orbit, we're going to have different views over the course of years of phases. So the moon changes its phase you know, every few days, every few weeks. Venus is going to change its phase every few months. So they are going to be different. But if I skip ahead to April 26th, so it's the 21st today, but if I go to the 26th and I take us to, let me see, right after dawn. So I'm going to take us to like, uh, that was too fast. That was too fast. Right after dawn. So like say 830 and I look in the Western sky. Let's see, look, we do get a little treat right here. We're going to see Venus. Venus is going to hang out in that uh post-dawn sky for the next couple of weeks, but right next to it will be the moon. So if you look, Venus is going to have, I'll just do this. Venus is going to have this nice crescent, like a, almost like a quarter, while the moon is also going to be in crescent. This is purely coincidental because they'll be in the same spot in the sky, but you'll get to see the moon right there. The moon is going to wash out a bunch of the stars behind it, but Venus is going to be nice and bright right next to the moon. And you can see why they're both crescents, because the moon, or sorry, the sun is down here. The sun is way over here, shining its light. And then that's how we see that side of the moon and that side of Venus. So that look for that in just a few days. Towards the end of the week, you're going to get to see this nice combo in the night sky. Again, that's the evening of April 26. Um, if you feel like staying up all night, I don't know. I don't know your life. Check this out. I'm going to fast forward through time. This is... 
this is going to hold true pretty much through the rest of April. But I'm going to switch over to the eastern sky right here. And I'm going to wait for just before dawn. So we're at 1 a.m. We're at 2 a.m. We're at 3 a.m. We're getting there. We're getting there right before dawn. Look at this. You get this nice cool row. So right before dawn, if you're up at like 4.30 a.m., I'm sorry, but you get a treat. Go look out at the eastern sky, right? You, you can tell because it, that's where the sunlight will be coming. You're going to get to see three planets right here. You're going to get to see Mars. You're going to get to see Saturn. And you're going to get to see Jupiter. Mars, we don't get to see phases like we do for, Ju uh, for Venus because Mars is further out from the sun than the Earth is. So we always get the full blast of sunlight on Mars. I mean, basically, there, it, there, it changes a little bit, but we get the face of Mars. If you have decent binoculars or a small telescope, you will be able to see a very nice fuzzy red patch. If you have really good telescope, you can see the polar ice caps and some surface features on Mars. <clears throat> right next to Mars, though, and this is a treat to see three planets. You're going to get to see right, where'd it go? To the right, you're going to get to see Saturn and Jupiter. Saturn, when you zoom in on Saturn with binoculars or a decent telescope, you will get to see the rings. You won't see it quite as detailed. This is a Hubble Space Telescope, and I'm pretty sure you don't have access to a space telescope at home, but you will get to see rings around the planet. You'll get to see a gap between the rings and the planet itself. It looks Saturn is one of my favorite things to look at through a telescope. It's absolutely gorgeous um, because you see the bright planet, the body of the planet, you see a gap, you see the rings. It is just unreal to see Saturn through a telescope uh, or binoculars. So if you have a chance, do that. And then you get to scooch right over to Jupiter. And when you zoom in on Jupiter, depending on your telescope, you get to see, and you can see this in binoculars, you get to see, let me pause time so they stay still, you're going to get to see four moons of Jupiter. And what you'll see will be four dots of light. You'll see a, a patch of light in the center is Jupiter, and you'll see four dots nearby. These are the four largest moons of Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And if you watch Jupiter over the course of night after night after night, you will get to see these moons orbit Jupiter. It's crazy. It's crazy. Again, these four moons were discovered by Galileo. He was the first person to spot them with his new uh, newfangled telescope. If you have a decent telescope, you will get to see some of the banding in the atmosphere of Jupiter. If the time is right, you'll get to see the great red spot. Uh, it's not visible right now, but it will be in the, the southern hemisphere. So you get to see moons. So check this out. If you are up at 4.30 and you have a decent pair of binoculars and you have a clear night sky, check this out. You get to see Mars. You get to see the rings of Saturn. You get to see the moons of Jupiter. You get to see some of the storms on Jupiter. I mean. That's that's worth it to get up at 4.30. I would think so. I'd give it a shot like once if I could. Uh, and that'll be true throughout the rest of, of April and into May. So so any night this, this week or next, go catch that. Uh, we do have more questions. We are starting to run out of time. So I want to make sure I get some more questions in. Uh, <laughs> is that inspired by the relationship between the moon and green cheese? I don't know where the whole moon cheese thing came from. I honestly don't know. I should do some more reading on that. If it just became like a, like a joke one day and then people just ran with it or if it actually came from somewhere. Mm. I wish the moon was made out of cheese because that would be awesome. I would definitely be pro lunar colony and potentially like wanting to move there. But 
sorry folks, the moon is just made of moon dirt, which, uh, which if you're wondering what uh, moon dirt is made of, it's made of earth dirt. It's made of earth dirt. The moon, or we're like 99% sure that the moon actually formed from the earth that about 4 billion years ago in the early solar system, earth was still forming. It was molten. It was, you know, magma and everything. And then something massive, like the size of Mars, slammed into us, tore a chunk out of us, and that chunk went up in orbit around us and became the moon. When we look at the ratios of elements on the moon, it's pretty much the same as the ratio of elements on the earth. Uh, everything on the moon has the same age or older of the oldest earth rock, so it didn't come later. And uh, it's like, as far as we can tell, like it, it just looks like the earth, except smaller. And this collision, and think about it, the moon is very special in our solar system. Uh, Mercury, no moons. Venus, no moons. Mars has two moons, but they're, they're just like little captured asteroids. They don't really count. The Earth has a moon. The Earth has a major moon. It's a big moon, uh, except for Pluto and Charon. It is the biggest moon in comparison to the, its, its parent planet in the solar system. It's massive. Like we're the weird ones. We're the oddballs amongst the rocky planets. The moon is definitely special when you think it came out of the earth. Could uh, Sean Embry, hey, uh, could we see Venus with the naked eye or would light pollution get in the way? You should be able to see Venus with the naked eye. Uh, just any night, this week or next, look as the sun is setting, even if the sun is still up a little, like just hugging the horizon, Venus will show itself um, unless there's a building or a tree or a mountain in your way. Just look for Venus. And by the way, this astronomy software, I, I pinned this to Boston. If you're in a different part of the United States, it's pretty much the same picture, but just shifted by an hour or so. And then also, depending if you're more southerly latitudes, then uh, everything's going to be shifted up, but no big deal. Anonymous, uh, very curious about black holes. Can you theoretically time travel through a black hole? If, no, I'm just going to say no. I'm just going to leave it at no, because I don't, because there is a much longer answer, but it ends up at no anyway, so we might as well just take the shortcut and just say no. Oh, yeah, Bree, thank you. I want to know about the meteor shower. Yes, 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 yes. So let me see. We want to go. I have some notes here for myself. And da, 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 pre -dawn. Yes, let's go till tomorrow. Let's, um, thank you for reminding me. That's perfect. Uh, perfect way. Let's go to April 22nd. Let's go to tomorrow. And we want to go to pre-dawn. So like, uh, like that's good. Like 5 a.m. And we're going to go towards the east, southeast direction. So pre-dawn sky, right as the sun. This can be a little bit challenging, but there is a meteor shower. Not that one. Where is it in the sky? I'm going to take away the deep sky objects. It was nice knowing you. Uh, the software is showing this uh, meteor shower, but it's not as good. It's not as good. We want to be somewhere. I'm not spying. It, it's, it is the, uh, the Lyrids. So let me search for the Lyra constellation. There we go. You look straight up. There we go. That's why I was looking too low. So you look in the southeast sky, you look for the sun, you go a little bit to the right, and then you look straight up in that pre-dawn sky, and there's going to be the Lyrid meteor shower. It's not going to be the biggest meteor shower. And if you need help finding it, there's a very, very bright star here called Vega. The meteor shower will tend to fill up the sky. When you zoom out here, the meteor shower will fill up a big chunk of the sky. 
you're only going to see about one to two meteors a minute at max. Uh, so meteors, it's a slow burn for meteor showers, okay? Don't expect like, pew, 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 pew. okay, 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 it's not a Hollywood movie, okay? Find a comfortable spot, get some blankets, get a drink, get someone you love, hold them close, look up at the sky and just just soak in the sky. You don't want binoculars. You want to see as much of the sky as possible. You want to soak in that sky. You want to really relax and just look around the sky. And every once in a while, some part of your vision will catch a, boom, a shooting star. And then a minute or two later, boom. On a typical night sky, on a typical night, you might only see like five of them or a dozen of them. During a meteor shower, you might catch a dozen of them in an hour. It doesn't sound like much, but each one is a nice little treat. So you want to look for that. The peak, it's happening right now. It'll happen tonight, but the peak is going to be tomorrow night, uh, right before dawn. But you can go out anytime this week. There's still going to be a lot more meteors than average. So as you're going to check out those planets in that pre-dawn sky, the Mars, the Jupiter, and Saturn, you can also catch this meteor shower. Thank you so much, everyone. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I can't thank you enough for joining me and the Boston MOS team tonight. Thank you for all the awesome questions uh, that that really filled up. I, just, I only scripted like like 15 or 20 minutes of material. It was your questions. I was counting on your questions. Uh, I was hope I was able to answer them. I hope I was able to satisfy your curiosity. I really hope I was able to spark your curiosity. Go outside right now. If it's a clear night, check out the stars. If you don't know the names, if you don't know the constellations, don't worry about it. All the names and constellations are just made up anyway. Make up your own names for the stars, for the constellations. Take your kids out uh, this Friday night. Draw constellations in the sky as you see them. Create your own stories. Create your own memories. That's how humans have been doing it for thousands of years, uh, and it doesn't have to stop here and now. You can keep that tradition alive. Just go out and enjoy the night sky. And thank you so much. Uh, James is going to come back on uh, with some closing comments, and I hope all of you have a great night. Thank you, Paul. Uh, what a great night. Thank you for being here. Uh, so great to see you, as always. We look forward to welcoming you back to the museum in the future. To everyone watching, thank you so much. We hope that you enjoyed yourselves. Um, thank you for spending your Tuesday night with us. We hope that you will check out some of the upcoming work we have. Um, once again, thank you to the Lowell Institute for making tonight possible. And if you enjoyed yourself and enjoyed this program, I ask you to go to mos.org slash science matters and show your support for our MOS at home initiative and programming just like tonight's event. Once again, that's MOS dot o-r-g slash science matters. We hope everyone stays healthy and we see you soon. Have a great night. Thank you.